Who do you want by your side when you go diving? A close friend? The best dive buddy available? Perhaps a guardian angel? There's someone who can be all of these things. Dan has been helping divers since 1983, when a group of passionate divers started an international non-profit medical and research organization dedicated to the health and safety of the global diving community. Where can I find Dan, you ask? Well, all over the world. Dan is an advocate for a more alert diving community and provides you with assistance every step of the way for all kinds of divers and their families. Because although we as divers want to discover the unknown, we should never do so unprotected or uninformed. That's why it's good to have someone providing you with emergency medical assistance, promoting diving safety and sharing vital diving research with you. Sometimes we all need someone to guide and protect us. When it comes to diving, that someone is Dan. Well, good evening to everybody that's uh, joined the um, the webinar already. Um, I see Tom Cross. Welcome, Tom. Nice to have you there. Uh, while we wait for uh, some of the uh, other folks to join us all around the world, um, Dr. Martin Young, nice to have you on board. First time uh, speaker. Um, Thank I you. know everybody's going to enjoy what you uh, your advice you have to share. Um, I hope you as uh, you are as excited as I am, and definitely some of the comments I've been receiving via Facebook, uh, email, and so forth. Um, you know, it seems like uh, we're in for a busy evening. Wonderful! I I have uh, waited uh, really patiently to to do this. I've gone over my talk at least twelve times. <laughs> so okay. well, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So while we wait for some of the folks. Um, uh, I'm uh, at this stage based in Plettenberg Bay. It's been a wonderful day for those folks uh, in South Africa and uh, the folks around the world that have traveled to uh, the Garden Route uh, in the Western Cape, Plettenberg Bay. I am, and then uh, Dr. Martin Young, uh, you and Neisner. We've had a glorious day. So uh, um, there's good diving around the area, and uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, possibly you've had some dives. Uh, let us know. Um, I see we've got quite a few folks uh, hopping in. Uh, Rico, uh, yeah, good vibes. Um, Jean-Pierre, good evening. Yeah, welcome to you. Um, good evening there. And we've got Roland. All right, folks are now starting to, to come on board. Roland, hi, guys. Good to be here. Uh, great. Yeah, nice to have you on board. Wisconsin, how's it, uh, uh, Laura? Ryan Williams, ah, nice to have you on board, Ryan. In fact, Ryan is uh, one of our uh, hotline agents uh, via the Dan um, Southern Africa Emergency and Information Line, so good to have him on board as well. Gideon, hi all, good to have you. Nala, greetings from Ireland. Okay, wow. Uh, we got another for, um, uh, Anjo, Joe uh, from Florida, or Jimmy in Florida. Okay, Jimmy, sorry about that. Who else have we got here? Anastasia. Good evening. Wow, really nice. Uh, we got everybody coming in. So uh, possibly what I'll do is just kickstart the webinar, the general formalities, some introductions, and then uh, from there I'll hand over uh, to Dr. Martin Young. So uh, let me just get my things all sorted here. Okay, great. So uh, welcome to another Dan webinar. I hope everybody's going to enjoy it. My name is Mornay Christo. It's usually I'll be your host. I'm also the CEO of Dan Southern Africa. Now, wherever you are in the world, it's great that you've joined the webinar. I know your time's valuable, and therefore, I hope that you're going to find this webinar informative, useful. So please ask your questions um, uh, during the webinar, and we'll address those. Now, uh, again, I hope that everybody's doing well, and uh, no matter where you are in the world, that you are safe and healthy, and hopefully uh, participating in diving activities again. Uh, the talk topic, as a general quick overview, is new advice for divers who suffer from chronic uh, ear infections. And uh, just a couple of basic um, webinar housekeeping rules. Obviously, uh, you'll find that you're muted and that your video is turned off for uh, the webinar. Now, uh, some of you folks have already introduced yourselves, uh, but for the folks that are still joining, 
please use the, use the chat and comments box to introduce yourself. And please tell us where you are in the world. Um, also, if you like, you can let us know what you are expecting uh, from the webinar. Now, during the presentation, please, again, use the chat or the comments uh, box uh, to ask a question. And just to help me identify the questions, if you can use the hashtag sign ask and then pose your question, that'll be helpful. If you do forget about that, no worries. I'll do my best to pick it up. But if you do the hashtag ask and then the question, it just helps me identify the questions amongst all the general comments. So um, just um, a little something on my end or ask. Now, as usual, the uh, webinar replay will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube and Facebook channels. So if you have to leave early or for those folks that weren't able to join due to work responsibilities or something else, um, if you've registered, you'll uh, receive that replay link and uh, you can view uh, a replay of that. Then just from my side, as usual, thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network or Dan for short. Um, it's the world's most recognized and respected dive safety organization. And for those folks that aren't Dan members yet, why not join today by visiting uh, our websites. If you're in the Dan Southern Africa region, you can go to dansa.org. If you're in the uh, United States, Canada, and so forth, you can go to dan.org. And if you're in the European uh, area, you can go to daneurope.org. And for the folks in Asia Pacific, China, and so forth, you can just go to danworld.org. Now, if you're already a Dan member, thank you for uh, all the support that you've given us over the years. Um, and um, just another ask from my end um, to help us continue offering great content via our YouTube channel. Um, it'll be great if you are uh, willing to support the channel by donating via the Super Chat uh, YouTube feature. And you can find that in the comment section right at the bottom. Um, it's up to you. Use it, don't use it. And it's if you do want to donate to help us keep this channel, maintain it and grow it, um, it's up to you what you'd like to donate. Now, this is not available via the Dan Facebook page. It's just on the uh, YouTube channel. So for the folks that have joined in via that. Now, yeah, let's meet our guest, uh, Dr. Martin Young. He is an ENT or ear, nose and throat uh, specialist based both in Neisner and in Cape Town in South Africa, who has a niche interest in the surgery for surface ear or ear canal ecstosis via the chisel method. Now, he has dived all over the world, accumulating roughly about 400 dives and held a Naui Dive Master qualification in the past. And he earned that at Alawal Shoal off the coast of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And um, for those that know him, uh, his instructor was none other than Andy Kopp. So, uh, yeah, very fortunate, uh, Dr. Young, to Legend. have uh, <laughs> as your instructor. Now, just a quick uh, overview of the topic before I hand over. Um, it'll address the chronic ear canal infection with or without surface ear uh, the management option for both the, and the advantages of the new chisel method over the old drill method. And if there's time, um, you know, Dr. Young will talk about the station tube balloon dilation for those struggling to equalize. So uh, with that said, over to Dr. Martin Young. I'm looking forward to uh, the webinar. I hope that everybody's going to enjoy it. And uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, over to you, Dr. Wonderful, um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to do this. I've waited a long time to uh, uh, get to talk on a platform like this. It uh, really is a great, great honor and a great privilege to, to do so. So uh, um, just to check with you, can you see the, the, the slides? Yeah, the, the slides okay. are visible and um, yeah, it's all over to you. Wonderful. All right, let's sleep straight in. So first of all, just to tell you what I want to cover, um, in about 35 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about humans and uh, why we don't uh, uh, really relate to the water all that well. We're going to talk about infections, the outer canal infections, otitis externa. We're going to talk about surface here causes prevention treatment and why a handful of ENT surgeons around the world, people like me, are raising a red flag over what is the conventional surgery. And that's the drill method. 
I shall then uh, demo one or two videos of chisel surgery and talk about it. And then uh, later on, if there's time, just a very quick mention about uh, eustachian tube balloon dilatation. That's a potential whole uh, lecture in itself. So, spoiler alert, humans are not well adapted for being water creatures. And the reason is, it's logical. We have to be taught to swim. We don't have uh, webbed feet. We don't have uh, thick skins and coats that keep us warm. And really, our anatomy is against us, particularly when it comes to our ear canals. And when we look at the truly marine mammal, mammals like whales and dolphins, they have no canals whatsoever. Nature has said, we don't need this. They're a disadvantage to us living in the water full time. Let's get rid of them. Seals and sea lions, they can actually close their canals when they enter the water. So this is what nature has given us. We've got a cartilaginous canal, which is the outer third. We've got a, a bony canal, which is the medial two thirds. Seals and sea lions, they can close this section so that then water never gets here. Whereas in us, water when it arrives here can give us trouble. Notice here that the canal is not straight, it's actually curved. And that creates, when we go into the water, a, a little <laughs> sump region that can trump, trap water. And that becomes crucial in understanding uh, why it is that we get so many uh, problems. Another thing which is critical to know is that this mechanism keeps itself clean. The superficial layer of drum grows over many months as a layer of skin from medial towards lateral. When it reaches the lateral third, the cartilaginous canal, where there's hair growing, where the wax is formed, that layer of skin lifts up, tears up, drops out. And in so doing, this clears away bits of sand, bits of seaweed, any of those things that find themselves in there. That's, this system doesn't work well in the presence of lots of water, firstly. And secondly, when you interfere with it using Q-tips and uh, ear buds, you're looking for trouble. So that's the mechanism we're dealt with. What I want to do is show you quickly what the normal ear canal looks like. And this, these are my canals. And it's important that I tell you how I captured that. I captured it using a little camera that you can buy online for less than 20 US dollars from the online stores. And we'll talk about that later. So this survey here is me. Uh, this is my right ear. If you look look over at the top there, there's a little exostosis. And if you look down or lower down here, you will notice the ripples of skin that are growing out towards the outside of my canal. This is my, my left ear. You can see just about my whole drum. There's a wide open drainage flow, nothing to obstruct drainage over there. So those are mine, uh, nothing too problematic. So what is it that gets us into trouble? Well, first of all, our ear canals do not exclude water like in seals and sea lions and stuff. They trap water. And this is what the consequences is. Consequences are we get a condition known as otitis externa. We get massive inflammation and swelling of the canal wall. It becomes red and sore. It can be extremely painful. This swelling can be 20, 30 times normal swelling. The, the whole canal blocks up, gives us stiffness. There's often leaking and uh, discharge. And really, it is a miserable condition. And most divers will uh, will know what this feels like. Now, now, a useful clinical trick that you can differentiate between otitis externa, which is here, and otitis media, which is problem here, is that if you tug on your cartilage pinna, that will hurt you if you, your problem's there. It's a useful clinical uh, differentiation. If you feel sore in this region and you tug here and it's not painful, chances are it's uh, there. Another thing is when this region is wet, it becomes a moist and warm environment that is wonderful for pathogens to grow. Bacteria like Staphylococcus, which commonly causes wound infections, Pseudomonas, which loves water, and uh, fungi. So 
those who spend a lot of time in the water and wind, they also get a reactive growth in the the bone which narrows the canals and it creates the condition that most of us know as as surface which makes otitis externa worse so the causes again chronic moisture um, situations of high humidity regions of the world can uh, lead to this people who work in high humidity environments like uh, uh, bakers or gold miners working deep underground, they are at the risk of it. People who spend a lot of time in the water, people who sweat a lot. So these are risk factors for, for otitis externa. People who fiddle, okay? I mentioned that that skin mechanism keeps us clean using Q-tips and those things tends to aggravate and worsen it. Whatever inhibits the drying out mechanism over here. So wearing any kind of earplug, hearing aid, headphones for a long time can hamper things. Then there are medical reasons. Some people have sicknesses uh, such as diabetes that makes them prone towards problem. Then critically, the anatomy over here is important too. So this is what it looks like. The canal is red and swollen, it's inflamed, and it fills up with a, with a whole lot of junk and uh, rubbish over there. And to try to uh, stop the situation from happening, the principles basically are to avoid the water if it troubles you. Well, that's not going to happen if you're a surfer or a diver or a water sportsman, but it does help you if you can to to uh, stop water getting in there through plugs, which we'll talk about a little bit later. When you do have water trapped in there, you can use an alcohol drop or swimmer's ear to put in to help dry it out. Don't put it in, in this situation because you'll go through the roof. It's a good diagnostic test, but not one that I would recommend and I've uh, done it and it wasn't terribly pleasant. So that's for drying out uh, uh, water, if you know you have the problem. There are water re repellents, uh, things like swim seal, which is much like that liquid that you can use on the car windscreen and the water bounces off it. That kind of principle, and it's useful and helpful. Do not use Q-tips. They make my life uh, fantastic because it generates work for me, but it's not good for you. But critically, whatever you can do to improve the ventilation that the natural drying out method is crucial. And this is where the shape of this region here, which we call the external auditory meatus, this is critical. Because when you have a nice round opening, you will dry out quickly. If you have a narrow slit-like opening, your ventilation is hindered. And people who have a slit-like opening, they are at higher risk for chronic otitis externa. And that happens through this conchal bowl moving forward. And rather than a nice round opening, giving you a narrow slit-like opening. And uh, that's relevant in how we treat people who have chronic otitis externa. So the treatment of it quickly, you've got to clean away all that uh, gunge which is in there, and that's generally uh, my job or role with a microscope. It's difficult to clean it if you don't have those tools. Uh, local cortisone and antibiotic drops, antifungal creams like Quadriderm, which is a really wonderful cream to use. Those are helpful and useful. If you're in trouble, you get Quadriderm and you put as much of that in as possible. It's useful to use local dressings that help reduce the swelling and through reducing the swelling, the nerve endings are not as stretched and uh, the, the symptoms get much better. Some people need tablets to treat this, oral antibiotics, analgesics and cortisone. Just treating about the, talking about the level of pain, this can be incredibly painful. I've had patients in the hospital on morphine to treat them. Let's talk quickly about chronic otitis externa. That's the person who day in and day out has narrow, itchy, inflamed ears, generally due to that slit-like opening, like that 
they are not limited to divers or uh, water sportsmen. They come fr from all walks of life, but there's one surgery that has changed their prognosis totally, and that's called an M neatoplasty. And this slide over here just talks about that. Why is it called an M? Because if you look at that upside down, it's an uh, it is an M, and calling it a W meatoplasty would have sounded a bit foolish. So, so um, walking through the slide, over here is a, a, a person lying down. This is their right ear. That's the top, which has been cut off. Over here is a conchal cartilage and conchal bowl. Uh, and when, what we do as surgeons, we, we make five cuts. One is a transverse cut where the canal where the conchal cartilage turns downwards into the canal. There's another cut here, two, three, opening these flaps, and then another fourth cut down there, which this surgeon does a little bit later on in the process, but there's a fourth cut there. These flaps of skin then get lifted off. These triangles, triangle A, 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 a and C get cut off. This surgeon cuts them off a little bit later. I cut them off sooner. We lift up that flap of skin, which is here in B, and we can then see that whole plate of conchal cartilage, which is causing the narrowing. And what we do is we take a big semicircle of cartilage out with the underlying tissue right the way down onto the junction of the cartilage and the bony canal. And when we close it, this point over here gets sewn right the way down to the bottom there. This point, which is, uh, which would be this step over here, D gets sewn up over here. That point over there comes up over there. Once we've taken away those flaps, there's a W and there are seven sutures which are put in. Uh, and this surgery really has changed people's lives. The those of you who, who want to watch it in, in gory detail, you can go onto YouTube and uh, look under that term, meatoplasty. It's a video by Thomas Linder. And this is a visiting surgeon, I think from Sweden, who visited Tigerberg Hospital in 1999. And I went and I watched a lecture of his. There was no Facebook or YouTube at the time, but I really liked the idea and I took copious notes. Uh, and I went on out, uh, went on out, and I s started doing it. Just these drawings over here. That would be that that transverse cut. There's the the other V. That's the flap of skin that we're going to keep. There's the flaps of skin that get taken out. That cartilage is underneath, and when you join join it up, it all looks like that. This really is a game changer. Not just water sports people. Anybody who gets trouble. Let's then uh, move on to what we call surface ear or um, exostoses of the canal. It's not only divers, it's kite surface kayakers, anybody who, who is in the water sport, uh, water sport world. And what's happening over here is chronic water exposure is making the canal bone grow. Over here is a little tiny one, much like my one. That's not great clinical significance, but if these are given time to grow bigger enough, critically what happens is they meet down at the bottom and that sump that I spoke about in the first couple of slides, that sump becomes much worse. And that's how the water gets trapped. This, this guy here has quite a reasonable outflow tract Right now, doesn't necessarily need surgery done, but this person does need to know that if they don't look after uh, themselves, these uh, growths will grow. So just talking about it in general, we, we talk about uh, it's not only surface. Um, people are reporting that in the northern climes, like Ireland, fishermen get this. They are out in the wind and waves and the fog and the mist and that. They are picking up surface here. Some people who are never in the water get it. That's pretty rare. But we think generally it's uh, related to regular temperature changes in the canals. I shall talk about that now. 
the general incidence in people who surf, and this is across the world, warm water included is one in three. There's between 23 million as a figure I've seen and 35 million surfers worldwide. One in three people get it. That's, that's across the world, warm water included. Included. When you're looking at cold water, the northern hemisphere, it's a massive issue up in Ireland, which has got wonderful surf and a great surfing community, it's probably much higher. Certainly in Cape Town, cold water is probably three out of four, if not more. There's probably a ge genetic influence in that if your, your mom and dad had these, there's a higher risk you'll get it. Colder water is likely to cause, cause it more, but it's not not exclusively that. Another issue is the length of time that one spends. Generally, it takes five or so years from the time a person starts surfing to surfing or diving, for that matter, for these growths to, to manifest. It can take 10 to 15 years for them to reach critical stage. Some videos, which I'll show you later. The youngest person I've done was aged 16. Who, who needed surgery. The use of gear to minimize it is critical and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. This is not a not entirely new problem. There have been Neanderthal skulls found. That's uh, talking 40 to 250,000 years ago with surfers here. There have been Central American skulls, 50, 60,000 years old, found with surfers here. I trust that they weren't actually physically surfing, they were probably diving for, for food. But what really saw a massive explosion of this was the invention of, of the wetsuit in 1952. Before that, few surfers could stay in cold water long enough to get this. The wetsuit came along uh, and an entirely new problem um, in the, the sporting world surfaced. What's interesting is recent surf wetsuit or even dry suit or uh, dive suit technology means they are more e effective and people can stay much longer in cold water. So new surfing technology means the number of people with this is likely to, to increase. The fundamental cause of it in my opinion is rapid repeated temperature changes. Now, I, I see relatively few divers with this. Most of the people that I see are, are surfers. And the difference between divers and surfers is a person goes on a dive and you're going to go down into water, which is possibly cold, but you will spend that whole length of dive time down at that temperature. It's going to be one big major temperature fluctuation, whereas a surfer, spends probably only one-tenth of his time in the water physically surfing. The rest, is, the rest of it's going to be duck diving through the waves and then sitting waiting for the wave swells. When they finally catch a wave, they are going to surf at speeds up to 35, 40 uh, k's, an hour, k's an hour, which increases wind chill which is an issue for the kite surface too. So th the fundamental that's going on is these rapid fluctuation temperature changes. It's going to be cold and wet and then wind chill and wet and cold and wind chill and going on and on uh, over multiple times. What that means is that is that is if people use protective gear, hoodies and plugs, this is a hundred percent percent preventable condition. And that's something that people in this, these are water sports need to talk about. So talking about the management of it, first of all, if you don't want to get surfers here, if you think you've got small ones, you want to use plugs, there's a whole range of plugs, there's press stick or uh, uh, what's called uh, Blue tech over in the USA. There are silicon plugs, there's Docs Pro plugs and surfers, which we'll talk about now. Um, people who have surfers here and who don't want it to get worse through surfing can use plugs. There's a challenge when it comes to diving, and I'll talk about that now. People who have minimally problematic surfers here can get rid of water, much like I spoke about with the chronic otitis externa. 
Ventilation helps you a lot. You can use a hairdryer, and I'll show you one or two things that I didn't even know about until I was working on this talk. In the next slide, probably wearing hoodies and the protection is brilliant, uh, and of course, surgery when it's problematic. So when we talk about ventilation, I, I didn't even know you could get a little battery operated uh, dryer. This doesn't need batteries. It's very much simpler, just a rubber rubber bottle bottle thing but these could really help and uh, make a difference to someone who's having trouble the use of docs pro plugs for surface absolutely fantastic they keep your ears warm but not dry when you wear them diving because they've got vents in the vent of the water can get through there can you afford to get uh, well, uh, water in there, that depends on how bad your surface ear is. When it comes to knowing whether they are safe for deep divers using plugs, I, I really don't know. I, I would need to talk to those who, who really they make dive medicine a, a speciality of theirs. My gut feel says that that is all well and good while it works, but if you're wearing one of these and you go down deep and uh, these vents, vents uh, clog up or block, you are possibly in great trouble. So Docs Pro Plugs, I know that people use them. I, I really don't know whether they're useful or not. Another plug, Surfiers, these are vented plugs that you can hear th through them. I don't know of anybody who dives with them. The uh, single set comes with various size fittings over there. There's a lanyard. They, they work really well. They are relatively costly. Let's then talk about the traditional surgical approach. This is the method that we are all taught as trainee surgeons, where you go and you make a large cut over at the back here. You're going to go through muscle and tendon and periosteum. You're going to flip everything forward. You're going to stretch the skin and muscle. You're going to cut, going to cut through, through the canal, make a large skin incision which, with long surgery and slow healing, and you're then going to use a drill to drill away the, the, the bone. Now, there's a number of issues with that. These drills are massively expensive as, as surgical tools. The uh, drill tips, and one can need three or four different drill, drill, drill tip sizes. They're single-use drill tips. They're thrown away after the end of each case. They are hugely expensive. But the major red flag here is that the drill, that drill bit cutting through the bone, creates noise. That noise has been studied and it's somewhere between 100 decibels and 110 decibels that the drill bit going around in the canal is creating sound. We know at 100 decibels the safe time limit for noise exposure is 15 minutes. Beyond 15 minutes, you are at significant risk of noise-induced hearing damage. At 110 decibels, that time drops down to two minutes. That sound goes through the bone into the skull to the cochlea on, uh, on both sides. Whether you're operating one ear or not, both cochleas are exposed. And I can take surgeons up to three hours to do one side. I know of one guy who had both years done in one go, taking six <laughs> hours, and he consulted me because he he couldn't couldn't understand why he he still feel blocked up. That is noise induced hearing loss, and that's the red flag that the the few of us around the world who are chisel surgeons are, are raising. Why is it a red flag? Well, most surgery that we ENTs do using a drill is done for life and health threatening conditions. People have chronic ear infections, they have growths of trapped skin called cholestitomas, they might have tumors, they might have chronic middle ear infections, they, they might have a cochlear implant put in and the reason they're getting that in, that in is because they're already uh, deaf. 
So most drill surgery, there is no, um, most of the concern is over a life and health threatening condition. Hearing is of secondary concern. Whereas when you're taking a sportsman who is having surgery for a quality of life problem, hearing after surgery needs to be a primary concern from the surgeon's point of view, not only the, 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 the person having the surgery. Another factor with surface ear, the middle ear structures are completely normal. Sound can get uh, conducted through them. There's nothing wrong with them. That raises the risk. And lastly, under general anesthetic, which is the way the surgery is done, uh, normal sound protection mechanisms that the, the two little muscles in the, the middle ear uh, carry out, they are absent because the person is under general anesthetic. That's the red flag. When you look at the literature, there's growing concern in the medical literature of drill noise from many sources. So neurosurgery, cranial surgery, dental surgery, and that's following the trend towards better occupational health and safety awareness as got, uh, regards noise. So there's a fundamental problem here and that's the medical dictum or the surgical dictum certainly is primum non nocere, and that means first do no harm. We as chisel surgeons think the drill method violates that principle. Now, just out of interest, this is a this is a journal article it comes from a relatively obscure journal, probably in China. It's 1999. But what they're worried about is the noise of the drill drilling instruments to the surgeons and the surgical team, and their conclusion was that drill sounds were loud enough for long enough that the surgical team needed to uh, yeah, 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 use head sets and uh, look after themselves. So what's the alternative? The alternative to drilling is the chisel approach. And these are basically the tools of my trade. This is a three millimeter chisel. This is a one millimeter straight Hetzler chisel. It's a custom made. Uh, a chisel that, that was made uh, at Dr. Doug Hetzler's request, and we'll talk about him in a moment. This is a curved chisel, also millimeter curved chisel, and these are multiple use chisels. These should uh, last a lifetime. The advantages, there's no skin incisions, there's no noise exposure. We do both years in one operation. It's generally quicker surgery, there are cost advantages, quicker healing, lower post-operative pain. The disadvantages, there are 20 of us around the world who know how to do it as chisel surgeons. And when I say chisel surgeons, I, I qualify that through saying that, that a chisel surgeon is a person who will tackle the worst case scenarios using a chisel through and through. Many of our colleagues can tackle minor, quick, easy cases. I'll demo one of them not having issues. Um, there are only 20 of us around the world. So if you want to see a chisel surgeon, you have to travel. Um, in terms of the, the, the world dis distribution, there's no one in Australia. There's no one in New Zealand. There's one surgeon in J Japan. There's no one in Europe. There are three of us in the, the Western Cape who, who have agreed in principle to, to who work together. When the world chooses to, to come to us, the rest of that 20 are, are over in the USA. That poses a problem which the training institutions we feel need to address. So what's the current status? Most people with this condition are really terrified of it. They've heard the horror stories of big incisions, painful, long healing times, two operations, that kind of thing. This remains a difficult surgery. Not many surgeons like doing it. Uh, no surgeon that I know of thinks it's a minor, quick and easy surgical procedure. Medical funders 
do not generally re remunerate this, the surgery well from the surgeon's point of view. I said the chisel method is not being taught at the trainee level. And looking at this whole picture from the doctor point of view, plus the person with it point of view, the attitude has been leave it as long as you possibly can. If you've got surface here, you, you deal with it, you tolerate it. So I, I frequently get the question, doc, do I need the surgery? I have two questions which I ask back. And first one is how miserable is your, your life right now and what factor does fear of what you think this procedure is going to be like play in you making up your decision many people with problematic surface here take between five and ten years to reach the point in time that they say right i'm finally fed up now's the time and that causes a problem because the second question which i ask is do you want minor surgery now or are you prepared to have risk having major surgery later? And let me demo what I mean about that. Mean by that, this is a photograph taken off the internet. This is someone who's got two smallish uh, bony exostoses, got good wide uh, drainage of water here, probably not causing any trouble. This most surgeons can very rapidly and comfortably uh, take off using a, a, a chisel. Most surgeons can. This one on the right, which I showed first of all, this is still relatively straightforward, easy surgery kind of case that I look forward to. From the surgeon's point of view, we can see the drum, which is this gray thing in the background. We can see where the drum limit is. There's lots of room over here. We can make a cut in the skin, flap it forward. We can tuck it out the way, put our chisel in. We actually know where the limits are, the, the no-go places. Um, that's the kind of case that I look forward to. Now, the, this, page, this photograph on the left is a photograph that a friend of mine sent using one of those cameras, which I mentioned. And his question to me was, do I need the surgery? Now, he's a surfer. He wears plugs religiously, never gets infections. Does he need the surgery? The answer is no. All right. But he should monitor this and make sure that this doesn't grow uh, closed any further. This this is relatively straightforward surgery from a competent chisel surgeon's point of view. This case now is quite the opposite because if you look in there, there's no opening into the uh, drum. We can see one large, large surface here uh, growth, and that's going to take quite some taking off. Now I'm going to run through this to just uh, demo what the operation looks like. I'll show one or two others in a moment. What I'm doing now, and I've just sped this up four times, is I'm lifting off the skin and I'm working using a camera and a telescope rather than a microscope and lifting off that skin and that, that skin's going to get kept to be put back again later using a bit of cotton wool. And now I'm using the three millimeter chisel. So in terms of scale, that chisel is only three millimeters wide. And you'll see with a couple of taps, we can lift off that large growth. And these two from this patient are probably the largest single exostoses, which I've, I have uh, taken out. Now, the, the, the reason I'm taking a little bit of care to to remove this big one is that I don't want to rip and tear away the, the skin, which is over on the rear, rear of it. I, I need to keep that in place to, to uh, uh, get the region to heal and uh, mend up well. So taking a little bit of time and care, but maybe we'll go a little bit faster here. Just taking it out. And now what is, what is worth knowing is that the normal healthy ca canal volume is only one milliliter. 
what I'm doing now is uh, going at very much faster and just uh, really demoing that it takes uh, a fair amount of work to clear away the rest of it. What I'm doing now is putting in a dressing which will swell up and that gets taken out three days later. So your total uh, blocked up length of time is only three or so days. Now that side that was bad enough look at him on the other side and even larger exostoses. Now these cases can prove to be really tricky and hard to do. I'm putting in the chisel, I've cracked it, loosened it and in a moment or so it'll come out. It takes a bit of coking, coaxing out. Those are massive exostoses. Okay. Now, now I'm, I'd like to demo this case, it's a much easier case, um, to, to demo how rapidly smaller exostoses can come loose. What I'm doing is I'm just lifting off the skin, which you'll, you'll notice in a moment. So many surgeons use a microscope to, to do this. I use a camera and a telescope. So I'm actually watching the video screen while I'm doing this and uh, working off the screen. That's a millimeter straight Hetzler chisel. And you'll see with a couple of taps, that whole exostosis loosens. Couple of taps, loosens the, uh, the, the uh, crack follows a natural cleavage plane that gets taken out. It took me about half an hour to, to take away the, the rest of them, these little ones over there, and then this one at the bottom. What I want to show you is what, how he looked three weeks later. I can see his whole drum. He's still fairly red, uh, red and inflamed. There's a little exostosis which I left accidentally there. That doesn't matter. But he, three weeks later, can go again into the water as long as he he, uh, he uses uh, plugs. This is just another case. I'm not going to show it in detail. But called surgery. You look in his right ear, it's completely closed. He's trapping that layer of skin that I spoke about, that skin that's meant to move out. Difficult surgery to do. The other side, not quite as grown closed. He probably surfs where the prevailing wind comes from his left. This is much easier to do. That's that layer of skin, which I spoke about. This is him a, a month or so later. I just cleaned away a bit of crusting here, so it's a bit of bleeding, but we can see his whole drum over there, and he's got a good wide, uh, wide open drainage. And the uh, left ear also is pretty much the same. We don't have to make a very wide round, round opening. And in fact, the more you take away, the more on either side you go up and bottom down, the higher the risk of hitting a, a, a critical stru structure. So you guys know about risk. Um, surfers know about risk, divers know about risk. No surgery is risk-free. The structures which are vulnerable are the eardrum, the jaw joint. Those are really not an issue. Um, minor damage is well tolerated, always heals. The facial nerve is a risk. The difference between risking the facial nerve on a patient is it's more and more likely the harder the cases to do. Okay, just talking about risk, there's a risk of uh, general anesthetic, obviously. I need to say that the chisel method eliminates the risk of the drill noise induced hearing loss. And I need to emphasize here, easy surgery is a far lower risk here. So this is uh, relevant to you guys. How can you take charge of your own health? 
But I kept talking about the camera and I've shown you photographs of it. And if you go online and search ear endoscope or camera or USB, you'll find lots of places to, to buy them online. I see one of them here priced just over 200 Rand. Obviously, courier fees are probably more. Um, this would be probably cost you a little bit over 500 Rand to get one of these cameras. And what that means to, to me really is that there's a, there's a huge opportunity now for water sports clubs, diving clubs, dive shops, organizations to become proactive in members monitoring the, their own situation. Do you have surface ear or not? Because prevention is far better than cure. And certainly young kids that are getting into surfing and diving, they should look at this on a regular basis regular basis. What these cameras also do is it means that through the application of telemedicine and COVID with social isolation and social distancing has really made telemedicine spring to the fore. There's nothing stopping anybody anywhere in the world having a telemedicine consultation with me where I can see what their situation is and it costs 20 US dollars which is next to nothing and in terms of telemedicine not just me any of the world's 20 surgeons who do it so that leads us into medical tourism uh, I'm going to say just one word about that um, those of you watching from overseas private healthcare in our country is amongst the world's best it's at a quarter of the cost of the USA. It's about uh, to do uh, both sides in a person is about 4,000 US dollars. It's 15,000 or more in, in the uh, USA now. So um, do, do we have time to talk about this, Mone? Absolutely, uh, Doc. Please go for it. Very interesting. Um, haven't got any complaints yet, so let's rock and right. roll. All right. So let's assume you are a diver. You've had uh, lots of trouble diving. You, you've had lots of squeezes, reverse squeezes. You've had barotrauma in that. Let's assume you've tried the exercises and you can find those exercises through most dive instructors or YouTube in that. You've used an antihistamine. You've used nasal cortisone. You've tried try to get this device, which is a little nasal adapter with a, an inflatable balloon there, which uh, kids are taught to use and you can use it too, that you blow it up. That's to get pressure in this region to try and exercise the eustachian tube. And if you're still having trouble, well, we surgeons have now taken a lesson from the cardiologists who've used catheters uh, and inflatable uh, balloon mechanisms to widen uh, narrowed heart blood vessels. We now use the same method to go into the eustachian tube under general anesthesia with a little probe that gets put there. The catheter gets uh, put in. It has a maximum limit of uh, the eustachian tube length. We inflate that to a pressure of 10, uh, 10 atmospheres. We leave it for two minutes, take it out. The patient goes home and a week later uses this for a month or so. And, and this is showing wonderful uh, results, not only in kids who, who might otherwise need grommets, but in people who who have uh, difficulty when they fly, people like uh, 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 pilots who cannot equalize, um, people who cannot, e cannot equalize if they dive. This is becoming relatively commonplace. Um, I think uh, most, most NT specialists and most, most uh, major centers now know how to do it. So worthwhile looking at. This is just a photograph of what that looks like. We're using the same camera which I used for my surface here. Now I'm looking 
down the patient's nose. We're looking at the opening of the eustachian tube. That's the uh, guiding probe that gets put in. That's the, the catheter that goes in through the probe. The, I think what we're looking at is the inflated cuff there that gets, gets inflated, taken out. Really straightforward, simple. So wrapping up now, we've moved. My, my feeling is we should be moving from an old area of drill surgery where one operated as late as possible to a new area of chisel surgery for surface here. You operate when the problems begin, following the principle of do no harm, so that we do minor surgery rather than major surgery. This is good news for water sports people with surface here. And the 20 of us around the world is a very small group of us believe this should become the gold standard. That's not going to happen. Um, uh, the doctor I'm going to talk about in a moment has gone to conferences around the world and he stood up and made his point and still nothing's happen happening about it. It's not getting taught in the universities and the training institutions. That will only happen when those with this condition demand it. Demand it. And those are those surfers and divers who find that they have to travel travel across continents to get this done, they need to ask the questions and say, why Why is it not getting done locally? I'm going to finish off by giving my personal thanks to Dr. Doug Hetzler, who's known as the Kelly Slater of surface ear surgery. He uh, practices out of Palo Alto, California. He's been doing this more than 30 years. He's done over 4,000 cases, and he re reached out to, to me when he read an article in the Zigzag magazine, which I wrote in 2016. We have established a friendship. I, I invited him in 2018 to come and talk about his technique at one of our conferences, and we actually spent two weeks together where we became good friends. We could not drive past a surf shop without rushing in there and chatting to the guys. This is in Hermanus, and there's Doug with his laptop, with his camera. He showed Mark that he, he needs to get some work done. Mark's making up his mind right now. This gentleman, some of you might recognize him. This is Giggs uh, Celias, and he's the four-time world kneeboarding champion. He's fine. He, he, he doesn't have a problem, but this is the her, her, her minus shop. So uh, Doug Hessler is a friend and a mentor. Uh, we share experiences. We talk to each other on a regular basis. Uh, and if you don't want to see me, you want to travel, you can uh, go see Doug. It'll cost you just four times as much. So thank you for that. Just to talk about surface air clinic, this is what the three of us in surgeon who are uh, as three of us chisel surgeons in the Western Cape region, like-minded people uh, wanted to set up for, for medical tourism. Uh, COVID has kind of uh, changed our plans massively. Hopefully once COVID is over, um, we can resurface there. Um, this is actually a Facebook page. There's tons of information there, tons of it. Um, um, I don't think that there's a single, single uh, bit of writing on this topic that w one should be talking about, which is not over there. Um, those of you who, who would like to contact me personally, I've got a personal Facebook page, you can can uh, drop me a mail. And I operate in Neisner, Hermanus and Cape Town. So thank you. I really appreciate your, your time. I know I've gone, gone on and on a bit and there's a lot to take in. But once again, I'm extremely grateful to Monet and, um, and um, thank you again for uh, your attention.
All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, amazing talk. Lots of things uh, I've learned I've never seen before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just before, there are quite a couple of questions, and I'll, I'll put them on the screen now, and you can have a look. But, um, you know, uh, ears, obviously, by the day, and emergency and information lies. The number one topic usually be that uh, sort of emergency situation, advice needed, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, quite often we've had the, uh, the, the surface here, bony growth, ecstasis issues. Um, and I know that one of the, the, you know, recommendations is that, as you said, if it's not causing any issues, then fine, but keep monitoring it. Yeah. However, if it becomes so obstructive that you can't equalize, then you're getting into pro uh, trouble. You know? and, uh, yeah. We have seen those. So, um, yeah. Um, so let me just, there, there are some questions. I'm just going to scroll through all the comments and I'll start from the first ones. I'll put them on the screen so you can also see them. And um, yeah, then we can take it from there. If I do miss any of your questions, please just post it again. Uh, but just give me a second to find some of them. Okay, the first one here is from Scott Cohen. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see that there, uh, Dr. Yang, or would you like me to read it out? No, no, no. I've... Uh... Um, got that. So, your your yeah, it's uh, difficult to to know whether you have chronic otitis external or, or chronic infections. Um, uh, most doctor with his or her salt will recognize. The symptoms of chronic otitis externa. So, so you would tell them, uh, my, I, I feel uncomfortable when I tug my my pin. It's sore. I'm, I feel a need to scratch in there constantly. I'm getting trapped in in this kind of cycle of this itch, which makes you scratch and makes you itch more. So there's no tricky words or catch phrases. You could use the term, I think I might have oh, Titus externa, or you could call surface ear, which is kind of the, the, the global term. It's not limited to, to surface. We, we said we're seeing it and then more and more people involved in water sports and more and more people doing water sports nowadays. So, so yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, pretty much the only catchphrase. I would use the catchphrase, surface here, possibly. Yeah, well, I mean, if I take um, uh, sort of diving along the southern uh, Africa coastline, and islands, you know, it's quite often long boat rides. So, yep. client uh, back on the uh, the water, temperature is pretty good. Back on the boat, and then it's a long ride back, windy and stuff like yep. that. So, all your teaching sort of you know revert back to that. Um, yep. uh, Scott, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. I'm gonna uh, just uh, post another question here from Gareth, uh, and uh, he's from Alberton. His question there, uh, Doc, can you see that? Yes. Um, not that I know of. I actually uh, don't know uh, the, 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 the nature of that uh, product. I don't uh, know uh, what the very phone is. Now, having chronic otitis externa, having surface here can cause tinnitus. But there's no guarantee that fixing it is likely to take away the the, the tinnitus. I really doubt that any kind of ear plug itself, which is used responsibly, is going to cause tinnitus. Now, whether one would say diving with plugs and is uh, using it responsibility, I need to raise my hands and uh, and really see what the diving medicine specialists ultimately say as i said my uh, gut feel is that it's probably risky all right well great gareth i hope that answers your question uh we got another one from laura all the way in the us uh, i assume she's asking whether the uh, medication is available over the counter there uh, not that I know of. I uh, doubt it. Um, Quadridum, the 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 drug and cream names 
there are sometimes countries specific so it may have a another name in, in the usa but i think the fact that it's got a uh, quarter zone in it chances are it's not chances are it's uh, not uh, but there's about to be a local equivalent and i think this is one of those questions that i shall once the talk is over i shall go online and i'll look and then i'll i'll drop a comment over there okay yeah that's great um so i uh, hope that answers your question in part lara but um as the doc said he'll uh, do his best to find some details and then we'll just post that via youtube and facebook for those folks that are interested all right on to the uh, next question uh, um a regular visitor and one of our board of subscriber members for Dan right. Southern Africa uh Russell Opland um he's uh, got a great question there so I don't know how uh, you feel about that uh, uh, Dr. Young. Uh, um uh, the 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 risk is high um i i have known and i've had uh people who have had to come to me who while they were just cleaning in the outside that the child has bumped them or they've fallen or they've they've bent down and they've knocked an elbow and they've shoved that bud right the way through yeah. the actual drum um the there's a risk uh, it's, it's a relative risk i think people who take care not to go too too deep it's probably okay there are probably much safer methods i think the swimmer's ear drops probably a much safer uh, mm -hmm. method uh, yeah. than those are. but we as doctors say nothing smaller than your elbow goes yeah. in your yeah your I, I, was the to, <laughs> I was about to mention that i know many of yeah. the talk from dr cronier says uh, yeah. the sharpest thing should be your elbow yeah. but quite often we get uh, folks with uh, you know the ear canal Uh, having an infection uh, especially in the um, sort of uh, more tropical areas and moisty areas so uh, yeah. yeah but or even you know yeah. toothpicks uh yeah. after keys and stuff because it's itchy and trying to get it out and then damages i guess that uh, yeah. in the ear a little yeah. bit and, you know all yeah. the bacteria yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the, um, yeah. the 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 tendency is to make things uh, worse if you do that mm. yeah absolutely right. worst case yeah. uh worst case is you fiddle about in there and uh, then the 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 q tip tip drops off and gets lodged yeah. in there and uh, now you you need a doctor like me with a microscope to to take it yeah. out yeah. so well, I, i do remember um some years back when i was dealing with the folks from uh, swim seal um they sort of had a nice uh, management approach you know for swimmers surfers divers and um for divers they said you know if you're going to be doing a lot of diving or you say in the water on a regular basis because your profession you know you need to have sort of this ear management program uh you yes. know, before you get in put some yeah. drops in when you get yeah. back out wait for it to dry put some more in so yeah. that you sort of line the uh the, the drum a bit and to yeah. again i guess try and reduce that risk anyways russell yeah. i hope um that um you know answers your question Um we've got Alex uh, Kitsia here. Now uh, he's just put tinnitus with a question mark. I think to some degree you've answered uh, in part tinnitus but Alex if there's something more that you'd like to know about um could you maybe just add another comment there and then uh, we can address that because I'm not quite sure what um what you want to know but yeah. over there's, to you, there's there's not a lot that uh, links tinnitus to diving or to uh service of medicine um i mentioned that um that um the the list of causes of tinnitus is huge um, pr pr pretty much anything from trapped wax to to growths on the nerve we're, we're talking mm. about a uh, non malignant tumor so people who have tinnitus who have um have surface ear which is not necessarily causing them trouble it's not giving them water trapping or, or mm. infections i i will tell them look there's a possibility that if you have one of these little growths close up to the drum that that's that that's causing it it's a possibility but there's no guarantee whatsoever that taking it off is likely to 
to make your tinnitus worse. Not oh, at all. Thanks, so, for, yeah. thanks for that, uh, Alex. I hope uh, that answers. If not, you can always just post some more. Then uh, we have another question here by, uh, from Peter, you know, again, just asking about the earplugs. Uh, you know, I think, um, Doc, you've sort of mentioned your concerns. Yeah. Uh, the only plugs that I know of and that um, we have always in part sort of recommended to consider would be the Doc's Ear Pro plugs. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure there are others and it, it has that Scott Bent uh, valve, but um, I guess you're right, you know, if that gets clogged up on the dark, yeah. um, you know, it can cause some issues. However, I have seen them at uh, DEMA, you know, year on year. They've been around for many years. And my recommendation would be, uh, you know, just to reach out to the, the manufacturer, which is um, uh, the ProPlex team, um, in the follow-up email, and even in some of the comments, I'll add their website, and you folks uh, can maybe just uh, reach out to them. I'm sure there are others around, um, but, yeah, hope that answers your question, Peter. Um, next question, another one from Russell, um, uh, Dr. Young. Um and if you can see it there yet, is it displaying on your screen? Yes, it does. Right. So, so uh, the 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 um, what one would need to look at is uh, what the negative consequences from that scar t tissue are, are causing, and you would do that from having a diagnostic test. <coughs> Testing your 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 hearing function to see whether the the uh, scar tissue itself is leading to any trouble. Now, now one can have an incredible amount of scar tissue. You can have calcification of the drum that causes little to no deafness, little to no conductive loss whatsoever. Okay. And in that context, there's no reason to, to take it out or whatsoever. We would leave it alone. All right. So, so um, we as specialists see many multiply scarred drums on a regular basis that, that need no treatment whatsoever. Now, would a person with a badly scarred drum be safe to go and dive? Chances are, as long as they are able to to comfortably uh, manage the water depth and the equalization, and they're not getting any negative, yeah, chances are yes, they uh, can. So, so scar tissue on its own really is not an issue. All right. Well, thank you for, for that answer, Russell. I hope that uh, addresses your question. Uh, next one is from uh, Roland. Um, if it's the Roland I'm thinking from down uh, Shelly Beachside. Nice to have you on board. Um, Doc, there's his question. About 200 dives a year. Sure. And get serious ear infections. Yeah. Well, the uh, Roland, uh, the thing to do is to use the the preventative treatments things like swim seal swim seal if it's uh, available to you it's a really fantastic drop swim seal first you go and you dive you come out you then then try to clear away the water and then use the swim women's ear drops so uh, you're the kind of guy that really needs to to look after and uh, manage it on an ongoing going basis. Now, that's assuming you don't have these bony growths, because if you have um, surface here with that, they might cause the infections. Then it's worth looking at getting them uh, uh, removed again. All right. Now, most cases of chronic otitis externa, most will respond to to drops, so yeah, you 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 you're getting quite a massive knock if it's happening three to four times or so every year. The the way forward is to look after your your uh, your health. So 
so possibly get one of those cameras and then look regularly and see, do you have a wax buildup? Do you have a big buildup of skin, which is likely to help water trap? And then if you do, then it's worth uh, definitely, if you're planning on going on a diving trip or a diving holiday, worth getting it cleaned out through, through a doctor like me. Mm. So, um, uh, Dr. Yang, I think there's a, a potential for you to get back into the water at Protea <laughs> Bank uh, because I think this is rolling from uh, um, Africa Dive Adventures. So, right. I think well, I'll go and have a dive with yeah. him and look at his ears. Yeah. So, uh, there's yeah. apparently a, there's a, <laughs> I am told that there's a couple of, couple, couple of resident great whites, which I know, which I, uh, I never ever got to see. And that, that suited me uh, fine. But yeah, yeah. no, I, the, uh, uh, the allure is uh, back again. It is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Roland has another question. Uh, let's yeah. have a look here. Um, Okay, I think that's sort of uh, uh, um, add on to the uh, previous question. Okay. Right. A, a really useful drop. One of the problems if you use alcohol drops too much is you, you, you kill the, the good guys that are living in that uh, region. Yeah. And it gives an opportunity for the bad guys, the, the pseudomonas normally, mm. to come. Now, now you can minimize that risk if you use a, a use an acidic drop regularly. So a drop like acetic acid, which is ordinary household mm. vinegar, mm. and it's usually a two to three three percent concentration. And you can make it up yourself through going to the shops and buying uh, buying the the common ordinary. Uh, apple cider vinegar, which is about a 5-6% uh, concentration, and mixing it 50-50, making mm. up uh, your own drop. Mm. Now, I think that that's a useful thing to do. Mm. And it's probably a little bit less harmful in the long run than swimmers here. There's certainly a theoretical concern that using too much swimmers here, you you risk getting in infections again. And there have been stories of the actual drum cracking. Oh, wow. yeah, 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 using the alcohol drop too much. So, so well, I, I recall um, a couple of folks in the past that uh, couldn't understand, you know, via the hotline again, using swimmers here yeah, on a regular basis, and that, you know, that high concentration of alcohol, yeah. then would just eat away of, uh, at that uh, layer of protection. And yeah. uh, when swim yeah. seal came out, it was such a nice balance, you know, where you've yeah. got that sort of nice blend. And and I like what you're saying, where you yeah. use, use sort of both approaches, but uh, just carefully manage it, especially, I guess, if you're diving daily, maybe two, three times yeah. with a day or two dive time in between. Then... Once again, uh, Roland, uh, get your your uh, buddy or your partner or wife or something to look at what your outer ear canal opening looks like. Because if it's round, it's going to ventilate well and quickly it's good for you. But if it's really narrow and slit-like, then your problem is not having enough ventilation. Hmm. Getting it wet, lots of water chapping, not ventilating it well enough. So uh, really, if uh, you have three or four infections every year, you kind of need to go to an ear, nose and throat specialist and say, well, look, why is it going on on that basis? And just make sure you don't have a small amount of surface air, first of all, or that, that uh, narrows canal. All right. Well, Roland, I hope that answers uh, your questions um, and hopefully you'll have a, a new diver coming your way soon. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Lucio uh, also wants to know about, does this affect the, the middle ear? I think that's a great question. Not really, uh, no. Yeah. no. No, no, no. No, um, 
No, that that whole topic. I noticed you you've done uh, Dan talks uh, covering it. That's yeah. a whole other thing. The the eustachian tube dilatation uh, does. Yes, if you got that problem, but the, uh, that again is a whole talk on mm. its own. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, on to the next question uh, from Dress, wanting to know about the bleeding technique. Uh, does it exist for uh, sinuses? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's quite uh, so. I do a lot of nasal work and a lot of sinus work and the 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 trickiest region to work in in terms of the sinuses are the frontal sinuses and the frontal sinuses have the narrowest drainage region mm. so so people who get squeezes and uh, uh, reverse squeezes very often as the frontal sinuses. Those are also the most dangerous sinuses to have trouble in because if the infection spreads from there, it's going to go backwards into your your brain, which is a life-threatening con condition. Mm -hmm. Now, the the fact that it's really tricky working in that uh, region, you need special interest, special instruments. You, you need nerves of steel, which I think I have because I work there. People wanted an or alternative to say uh, what is the other method of rather than going in and doing surgery what's the other method for widening open the the sinuses and improving the the drainage and and yes there are doctors who do nothing other than this uh, dilatation te technology okay. it, it, it's not an operation that I've ever seen done. I've not done it personally. I've never, never really personally felt the need to or go along that uh, route. But uh, um, people having a lot of squeezes and re reversed squeezes following diving, you could possibly find a doctor who who does a lot of this and have relatively minor surgery that's relatively quick that's that's possibly capable of helping the answer is uh, uh, right. yes yeah Andres, i hope that answers your question thank you for that and gareth has a very similar uh, sinus related question uh, should be displaying on your screens right now yeah no uh, it says squeeze that's yeah. a squeeze so so again, again, the the medical treatment would be to to use a nasal cortisone spray, use an antihistamine. Um, you can try rinsing your your nose using saline. You can try using a long acting decongestant, which will last long enough to get you through your your dive. Uh, but if you still have trouble, then it's the fact that you have an extremely narrow frontal sinus drainage. And mm -hmm. then it's worth going going and seeing a, 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 a ENT like me who will get a CAT scan done, then take you through what it is to to get that treated mm. the the person who dives repeatedly getting lots of lots of squeezes and they come with a mask full of blood you're taking quite a high risk in the long term um, he, one could go from a, having a minor inconvenience to having a massive infection there mm. and, and the infected frontal sinus is not a nice sinus to mess around with once again if it drains if it ruptures through the sinus uh, bony margins it's very often going to rupture down into your 
eye socket, which is a big problem, or an even larger problem, uh, ruin to the brain. So people who are having trouble, we would say, you can do well to try decongestant nasal spray before diving. Use an antihistamine safely. Um, you can use a cortisone nasal spray. Helps if you don't smoke, of course. Um, those are all things to try. And if that's not helping at all, you need to go to an ear, nose and throat specialist. And it takes a risk you're taking a risk if you carry on diving like that. The, your, your, your diving medical doctors, they can also climb in on this. Um, I, yeah, it's a risk. All right. So, uh, Doc, we've got about 10 odd questions still left. Are you still happy to? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, well, great. So, for the folks that are still around, great. It seems like everybody's still enjoying it. Loads of great questions. And here's one from Tom that I think is quite nice because this is something that I've heard quite a bit, you know, that divers suffer from. The wax buildup, uh, Otis Externa, and now what, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. The person who's swimming a lot, spending a lot of time in the water, it's probably not wax, all mm. right? Because wax melts away in the water. So oh. if you're, you're doing a lot of swimming, that wax melts away and, and vanishes. That's probably that canal skin, all right, which won't melt away. You can't flush it away. You can't syringe it away. You can't use candles. There's this whole myth about using uh, candles to, to take away wax that uh, doesn't work. Um, there's pretty much nothing you can do that is safe. Now, those cameras, which I mentioned, they, they are marketed as a means of clearing away your own wax. Now, I, I've tried them in uh, my own years, and they come with little attachments and that. It doesn't work. So, so don't think you're... you're uh, getting one of those cameras to to solve you your own wax problems. But it's useful if you do get one of those cameras to take a yeah. regular look. Now, if you have service ear with a skin um, build up, that's that's kind of kind of the the work that we do with a microscope to go in and to lead it away. Mm. A, a person who's planning a, a dive trip, you're going overseas or going to go to the Maldives or somewhere and go diving, it's worth doing that first. Get that problem sorted out, get a checkup done, and then you're, you're, you're less likely to have trouble. Mm. Oh. But uh, re removing wax personally, there's no way which is safe. The, <coughs> excuse me, the, the pharmacies do sell self-flush mechanisms. Um, the trouble with that, uh, unless you've got one of those cameras, you're putting a lot of water in there. It's under pressure. You're going to make whatever's there swell. The likelihood of making it worse is relatively high. Hmm. Okay. Well, Tom, I hope that answers uh, the question. We've got uh, Harry here, and it's more of a statement. First of all, he says, thank you. Excellent talk and that he's been suffering from tinnitus for 40 years. Um, Harry, I hear you, but I also have uh, tinnitus in my left ear, so I know the, the feeling. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyways, he um, you know, obviously hasn't found a solution. As far yeah. as I know, there isn't really a solution, but I'll Maybe. hand that over to you. Yeah, the, the, the person who finds the solution to tinnitus uh, hmm. will get the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, medicine. There's hmm. no, no doubt to it. Okay. So we know that trouble right the way along the, the system, trouble from wax to build up in the canal, surface hmm. here maybe, trapped skin, trouble on the drum, conductive things, trouble in the bone, to nerve loss, wear and tear, be it from ner uh, wear and tear of getting old or noise-induced, medications, medications can, 
can do it. And last of all, the, these little growths on the nerve. Hmm. So that's the range of problems. Um, the, the reason to go and see someone about it is to see which one of those is likely to, to be. That includes having your, your hearing tested so that we know what your nerve functions like. Most, oh. most people who have tinnitus have wear and tear. And the most useful thing you can do for tinnitus, and I'm doing it right now, I'll take it out, I'll damn it, you wear hearing aids. And trust me, you could replace your whole dive gear three times over for what, what a set of one of these hearing aids costs. But that's extremely useful for, for people who have tinnitus. Get the quality of the sound coming in better. Yeah. Then many people who have life-changing tinnitus and that they need to go go on to medication that helps them cope with it better. So you're talking about antidepressants and uh, anxiolytics. You're talking about seeing psychologists who will help them cope with this sound and say, well, look, you've got to think about it as a sound that's coming from outside, not coming from inside your, your head. So, mm. so most many people think that when they get told that they've got tinnitus that there's nothing they can do that's not true mm -hmm. there, there's a lot one can can uh, do and i shall actually if i can get onto youtube i'll uh, uh, post a link to to jerry or i'll yeah. pass it on to you uh, yeah. and it's basically an article that I wrote about uh, her tinnitus. So, okay. so yeah, it's a rough one. Um, but if yeah. your your hearing is down, and if you address that using hearing aids, like me, you you're likely to to notice that it becomes less of an issue. Absolutely, I agree. I only have uh, one hearing aid, and um, it definitely makes a huge difference. Just don't go diving with these things in. It really <laughs> is a, an expensive <laughs> mistake. <laughs> All right, well, Harry, if you're still online, um, I hope that uh, maybe provides some insights how you can address uh, you know, this, this really difficult issue. Anyways, on to another question. It's from Nikki. And she struggles with re uh, reverse blocks, um, but seems to have, a, you know, success using the Valsalva uh, maneuver to equalize. Okay, is it in your your nose or in your actual? E e e e is it a usation problem? Use usation tube problem, or a nasal problem? All right, so we'll just wait for um, so, Nikki if she's still so online. Is it your the the if it's a eustachian tube problem, the eustachian tube, that tube this is fairly long. It's probably four or four or five, no, say four centimeters long. That can have multiple little flap-like valves, and the way the that valve may lie may function like a one-way valve. All right, you know how one-way valves are. I think DVs and BCs have one-way valves in them. So it's not uncommon to, to have trouble like this, but this is one of those situations where, again, if decongestants, antihistamines don't work, and, and, and again, if it's causing you trouble, if you're getting barrow trauma, you should just contemplate having seeing a doctor who can offer you the eustachian tube uh, dilatation. You're in fact one of the people that the the operation was meant for. Mm. Yeah, she um, Nikki actually just commented further down yeah. in the uh, feed there. So yeah, definitely the station tube problem. So yeah. Nikki, I hope that uh, answers your question. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you want to get hold of uh, Dr. Martin Young for more uh, advice, you know, he, he shared his details. I'll share it in the follow-up email and uh, see what you can do, you know, to, to resolve yeah. that. 
So, um, yeah, on to the next uh, question from uh, Richard. Uh, he's all the way from the Philippines, and he wants to know if you know of anybody in that area that can possibly um, help or you can refer him to. Uh, not chisel surgery. The, the closest is in uh, Japan. That's the, mm. the closest. Their cost, I think it's around half the, the cost or so of the, the uh, USA in terms of uh, doing the, 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 the uh, surgery there. It's around half the cost. That's the medical cost, but your cost of accommodation, your cost of flights, the cost of living there is probably more. So, so like I mentioned, there are 20 of us chisel surgeons worldwide. And, and, and I think, um, yeah, there's, there's no one in the, 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 the Philippines. Yeah. So, um, Richard, what I can recommend is uh, if you want to leave a comment further down or reach out to me tomorrow by the um, uh, uh, email with the replay links and things, um, you know, we can uh, take the discussion further and uh, I'll connect you with uh, Dr. Young and you guys can possibly hammer that out to, to find a suitable person. So I hope that uh, will help you, Richard. Um, yeah, we've got Gareth here. I'll just quickly display his. He's more just saying, look, thanks, uh, great. He's got hearing uh, loss, got all the bits and pieces. But again, tinnitus, you know, it seems to be a... Yeah. Uh, quite a big concern and I think uh, we've addressed that quite a bit but again yeah. uh, God if uh, you need more please just reach out you know via Facebook uh, the mail that I'll send etc etc unless you want to add more to that you know I'm just worried yeah. we've got quite a number of other uh, folks on as well um, let me see uh, we've got CH Diver um, asking uh, the question over there I don't know if you can see it on your screen what price range? Oh, I think the, we did. Oh, okay. no, sorry. No, we didn't. Okay. The <laughs> – there's family. Good. Great one. Um, the cost in local terms, it's a, not a long hospitalization, uh, not a long theater. Your time in theater would be probably 45 minutes. Uh, three in a, in, a, in a day clinic, count that at 200 rand a minute. Um, surgeon's fee is about a third the, the fee of surgery. surgery. What is really expensive is the kits for, for mm. two sides. That kit alone is 28,000 rand. Uh, as far as I know, last time I looked. Medical aids cover it if you have uh, have insurance. So it's a uh, most medical aids cover it. It's a recognised procedure. Um, you you are going to pay probably the same for eustachian tube or dilatation as you would pay for surface uh, ear surgery, which which in which in my uh, realm is around. 50,000 rand or lump sum. That's the whole, whole okay. uh, package. All right. Well, I hope that uh, addresses that question. If you want more, um, yeah, maybe just reach out to us. Yeah. Um, we have another question from uh, Rich. Um, you know, just based on the recommendation you made on making yeah. your own mixture, yeah. does that sound yeah. about look like? Yeah. The, the hats, that's uh, pretty much the women's ear uh, mix yeah yeah okay they they um uh, different pharmacies often make up uh, different mixes of uh, women's ear the the most important part of it is the alcohol that dries up the the uh, mm. fluid there. but putting in the vinegar is good because it helps um helps minimize the the likelihood of the 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 bad bugs coming back again in a vengeance but you've then you got to factor in the fact that you're killing the good bugs too so so, 
swim is here, I wouldn't use it multiple times every day on an inner definite basis. There's certainly a the theoretical worry about uh, damage to the the drum there. Okay. Uh, vinegar alone is absolutely fine to use. Okay. Yep. All right. So here's an interesting uh, a feedback from Laura again, and yep. it has to do with that um, uh, ear hair dryer that you were referring to. And in fact, okay. one of the game docs said to use it, but yeah, um, yeah read the rest. It yeah. dried out the year yeah. so much. That, That's interesting. Uh, another issue. Yeah. Hey. I, I, I had never heard about the Mac dryer until I, I, I uh, got into. Uh, to uh, writing the talk. So it's a new one. It's a neat tool. It's neat. But the, the, the competition is that rubber squeegee thing, which I okay. showed, which never runs out of batteries. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's sort of suction to it. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, interesting. Thanks for that feedback, uh, Lara. Yeah. So, um, yeah, next question from Samari. Um, uh, she's asking about the swim field, if you use it quite often. I uh, uh, doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I uh, doubt it. Now, now uh, people who have have quite extensive surface here, they might, if they've, they would be trapping water anyway, and they put swim seal mm -hmm. there, then they'll have quite a large trap or a large sump or so of um, swim seal yeah. um, at the likelihood of it giving a, you any long-term trouble no i i uh, doubt it okay all right so uh yeah just a comment from roland from africa dive adventures uh, the uh, shelly beach by tia banks he says yep. he's waiting for you to, to come and visit. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, so you know what? If he does, uh, uh, no, uh, know what? If he gets me three guys who need surgery done over the same week, I, I, I'll come up, do them, spend three or four days diving with them, and then I'll do the follow up and then come, come back. All right. Okay. Well, there you go. Challenge. <laughs> All right, so next question again from uh, Lucio there. He says, I've been diving, uh, no problems, and then you know, some issues started happening. Um, yeah. Uh, what are Middle your years, on that? No, no, no. Um, one would want to, to look at what's going on in your nose if you, you've got those uh, uh, problems. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's occasionally linked to to nasal problem. That goes in hand with uh, barrow trauma, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I uh, hope that addresses the question. Yeah. So, um, so drops are, are not likely to. To clear that up. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have linked some uh, ear guides and uh, recommendations in the follow-up right. mail that you'll receive tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, keep a look out for that then. If uh, you want more info, you can always just reach out cool. to all the different right. band channels. Yeah. Right. All right. So, Deanne uh, is uh, yep. also just wanting to know, I think you've addressed that yep. uh, via right. Samari. So. Well, well, you actually – the the – the real purpose of using swimmers eardrops is to dry out the the canal. So you want to put them in, give them ten or fifteen minutes to dry, then use your 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 hearing aid because you don't want to put the hearing aid dome in that that takes away the ventilation and then you you stay moist there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I don't think it's likely to damage you negatively. Um, the likelihood of damage damaging the the the, the, the hearing aid itself not likely to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Deanne goes on and she says that ANT has promoted the use of pipes and peroxide on a weekly basis, and she has some concerns. Um, don't know what your feeling is about that. Um, 
I, uh, that's the drop that I use um, once the once the operation's done. It's the the drop that uh, uh, patients use three times a day while they're they're mending and uh, uh, and healing. It's a very useful drop. Um, useful to take away wax. I don't reckon it's a risk. No, no. Um, small amounts of wax is helpful and uh, useful. Um, people tend to have more trouble if they have too much wax. Mm -hmm. As long as you're using a method that's not traumatizing your ca canals mm -hmm. through through taking out the wax, it's yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, no, not an issue. It's actually reasonable. That's a reasonable recommendation. That okay. Well, the end. I hope that uh, that helps. Uh, another sort of drop-related um, question from Lucas. Um, yeah, about tea tree oil. Yeah. So I think swim seal has uh, swim seal is partly uh, part, part, that, That's one of its one of its ingredients. Uh, as I recall, um, the the it's likely to work in probably the the same manner. You would do just as much good and much cheaper if you use olive oil, right? And I would worry if you use a concentration of tea tree oil which is too strong and use it too often mm -hmm. you, you could possibly get a chemical reaction or an allergic uh, reaction to it so i i wouldn't go out and uh, purchase it to use it on a regular uh, basis okay. in preference to either swim seal or even ordinary oh. olive oil or if you want to use johnson's uh, uh, the the uh, one for four babies, yeah. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I hope that that helps, Lucas. Um, we have another question, and hopefully, I get the name pronounced uh, correctly. Ken Siken. Um, anyways, wants to know, uh, you know, rinsing the ear, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then drying it. How important is that? So, it, it, it's a reasonable protocol after you've gone uh, into salt water or even fresh water to, to rinse out using clean sterile water. Mm. I think that that's a good principle. Um, you never really know what you're, you're, you're diving in. You even seawater can have diatoms and algae and things which can con contribute to trouble. So it's probably reasonable advice to keep a bottle of drinking water. And when you come, uh, when your dive is over, you just spray it in and then you pop in your, your, your um, swimmer's eardrops. Yeah. Okay. That's a good, yeah. Oh, it's a uh, reasonable, yeah, reasonable to do. All right, so um, Dr. Yang, this brings us to the, um, <laughs> the last question of the evening. Okay. Um, I'm sure as the feed goes on and replays, we might get some more, sure. which I'll share with you. But this one is from uh, Marina, and she's a seems like a new diver, but has some allergies and she's on some medication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, maybe any suggestions for it? Yeah. So once you've tried maximum medical treatment, once you've tried the antihistamines, it possibly means changing with different types from one type over to the other, following diving medical advice. How I need to, to make it clear that I'm not dive medical qualified. I've never done the diving medicine course. So I, you have members who are way, way, way uh, 
better qualified than 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 me. But if you've used the medical treatment and you're still having trouble and you want to carry on uh, diving then and you've gone through the exercises you've used that little auto vent thing uh, which is available probably online you've tried that and having no luck that's when the eustachian tube dilatation is helpful yeah yeah All right. leave it well, at that um, yeah we'll leave it at that um just loads of comments coming through uh just thanking us great feedback um uh, enjoyed the advice uh we've got uh, one from nikki thanks so much really love the talk one from Shimari, fascinating talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I won't>. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff there, uh, yeah. So, uh, also, another one uh, from Zoo. Uh, great talk. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, Lucio from uh, says thanks. He's actually going to go see great. some uh, specialists great. next week. Great. So, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thanks for clearing it up. I can't remember. Oh, Samari, you asked about, I think, the swim seal or something like okay. that. Right. Lucas says, thank you. You've answered my questions. Okay. It helps a lot. Um, and so it goes on. So, yeah. Uh, Ingrid says, awesome talk. Uh, thank true. you. Tr yeah. country, so, uh, yeah. All great yeah. stuff. Um, hey, I'm also a fly fisherman if anybody's uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> cracking invites um, over to Dostra. yeah all right so we've even got the folks from uh, dan europe and uh hungary they Lovely. say awesome presentation very useful and interesting Thanks. yeah only happy uh you're welcome to share it with all your folks and people yeah. in uh, in europe uh tom says great webinar very interesting thanks a lot sean I saw there was one question, uh, last one, that um, if you're happy to uh, look at yeah. it, and then I think we should say thanks uh, for okay. all the folks. It's, it's really been great. I've learned a lot. There's a, I wasn't familiar with the chisel um, method, and it seems to be extremely um, uh, useful in the sense that, you know, yeah, uh, induced issues or hearing is not an issue much quicker surgery time and then uh you know uh, post-surgery healing time is far quicker so yeah great stuff all right so there's the question um all right the 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 advice pretty much is the the same maximum medical treatment for your nose you can use salt water rinses Nasal rinses, you use those netty pot things. That's helpful. You use an antihistamine, nasal cortisone spray. Uh, use a long acting decon. Uh, just since, again, if the diving medical doctors are comfortable about that, because you don't want your decongestant wearing off midway through a dive or mm -hmm. through a multi tank dive. And if that is not helping for you, then the answer is your session tube dilatation. From the patient's point of view, it's not sore. It's, it's a day case thing. You don't have any downtime following it. It's just um, your, you, you need to get authorization from your health insurer. And if you don't have health insurance, it's costly. All right. Yeah, well, I hope Dr. Young is still there. Oh, there we go. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah. Just here, yeah, Lucas again, all the way from the Netherlands. He says, uh, he asked further yeah. down to pronounce um, thank you, I guess, in Afrikaans, which is very similar to Dutch or, uh, you know, the, okay. the different languages. And, um, yeah, there's my donkey, buy a donkey in, okay. in, in Afrikaans, yeah. Kelly Bishop, uh, she says, thank you so much for the show. Very interesting topic and so forth. Uh, Tom again says, thank you. Very interesting. Um, enthusiasm is great. Greg Dressel, all the way from Port Elizabeth. Uh, nice to have you here. Um, let's see who else. Sean, thank you. 
just want to put them all up here. Uh, Susan Santos, uh, quite often she joins us as well. So thank you very much for the great webinar. Very interesting topic, answers a lot of questions. Well, that's great. I mean, that's really why we have them. Yeah. So I'm glad yep. that worked. Um, Ingrid, uh, caught some, uh, <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, so the uh, CH diver that asked all the uh, questions, he says, yeah. thanks a lot, very informative. Great. So from my side, I think, uh, you know, uh, we all had a great time. Uh, we still Thank got you. quite a bunch of folks uh, on the call, so it just shows you um, how people are keen uh, to learn about this. And I'm pleased that uh, everybody found it informative. So, um, Dr. Martin Yan, thank you so much for your time, your enthusiasm. And uh, for any of you guys who want to get hold of him, you can either just uh, you know use the comments, uh, and we can put you guys in touch, or um, you know I'll share all these details in the follow-up emails and so forth. Or you can Google him; you'll find him. It's quite easy. Dr. Martin Yan, his website and Facebook all comes up. So, yeah, good for you. Any parting uh, advice or words from your side, Dr. Yang? Yeah, don't believe everything you read on a Google about me. I was a politician for, for a while, the worst two years of my life. So, so. <laughs> All right. so anyway, yeah. yeah, good. Thank you. The, the right. final word is that the, the people who get... Um, people who live in countries where the chisel method is not done, you will only get your doctors over there to change their tactics when you go and ask them, why are you not doing it like this in large numbers? That's the, uh, that's the way to uh, change things. I mean, it's crazy that people should have to travel from Australia to South Africa to have surgery, but that's the that's the uh, nature of it. Many thanks. All right. Well, again, from my side, thank you for supporting Diamond Alert Network or Dan, the world's most uh, recognized dive safety organization. For those folks that are Dan members, thank you for your support. For those that aren't, um, uh, as I said earlier, easy enough to join and why not consider joining today if you're in the Southern Africa region. It's danesa.org is our website. And you can just look that up if you're in the um, United States, Canada type areas. Um, you can go to dan.org uh, for the Europeans. That's daneurope.org. And if you're in an area that you can't find on any of those websites, just go to danworld.org and the different teams will assist you. From my side, I hope that you enjoyed um, the webinar. It sounds like it. It looks like it. So, um, yeah, I think that's good night. Until the next one, um, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, hopefully hosting uh, Dr. Martin again. Uh, if there's interest and, and anybody has any questions that we can um, explore even further. Uh, but for my side, thank you very much. Good night. And yeah. that's it from my side. Night. All right. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.